Hello, welcome to Bite Size Med. This video is on endocytosis and exocytosis. The cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Stuff moves across the membrane to either get into the cell or to get out of it. Small things like ions, they can use protein channels and they can diffuse. But what about macromolecules? They need another way, and that's by using vesicles. These vesicles pinch off the membrane. If they're going to bring things into the cell, the process is endocytosis, because endo is internal. And if instead the cell is throwing something out, that's by exocytosis. Exo is external. And these are the methods of bulk transport. There are different kinds of endocytosis. It could be phagocytosis, pinocytosis, or receptor-mediated endocytosis. Phagocytosis means cell eating. This happens only in a few kinds of cells, like in the immune system, neutrophils and macrophages. What do they eat? Pathogens like bacteria, tissue debris, etc. Whatever the substance may be, when the cell comes in contact with it and it wants to engulf it, it will form these extensions called pseudopods. They go round the substance, meet and fuse. Now it gets pulled into the cell and separates from the membrane. Now this cavity, lined by that phospholipid bilayer, is called a phagosome, and it's got the engulfed material inside. That needs to be broken down. Among the organelles, which one does that? The lysosome. The phagosome fuses with the lysosome to form a phagolysosome. These lysosomes have hydrolases. They will digest the material, and what remains that's undigested, that cannot be broken down, that forms the residual body which will then get extruded from the cell. This extrusion is by exocytosis because the cell is throwing its contents out. So that is phagocytosis. Pinocytosis is similar, but it's different. Instead of eating, the cell is going to drink now. This is fluid phase endocytosis. It gulps in the extracellular fluid with its dissolved solutes. So the vesicles here are smaller. These are called pinocytic vesicles, or pinosomes. They will then fuse with an endosome for further metabolism. Unlike phagocytosis, pinocytosis is seen in most cells, for example, in the small intestine. But it's very nonspecific. The cell is just gulping down the ECF with whatever is in it. This process can be more refined with receptors, and that's what happens in receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now, most forms of endocytosis use something called clathrin to form the vesicles. This clathrin has a triskelion structure, so it has three legs. It's a three-dimensional structure, so it forms a cage around the vesicle. Receptor-mediated endocytosis usually involves clathrin, and if it does, it's called clathrin-dependent endocytosis. The cell membrane has depressions. Clathrin is located beneath these pits. These are coded pits. They are coded with specific receptors. The two are attached by things called adaptins. So when the ligands bind to the receptors, the vesicle is going to form. It's more specific than fluid phase endocytosis because a specific receptor is involved. Now as the vesicle forms, there's another molecule called dynamin. That's located at the neck of this vesicle. It's a GTPA, so it uses GTP and helps pinch the vesicle off the membrane. This vesicle then loses its clathrin coat. So that's uncoating, which is done by an uncoating ATPase. So it uses ATP to remove the coat. And the clathrin can be used to form another vesicle. After uncoating, it fuses with an endosome to form an early endosome. The endosome has proton pumps on its membrane. They send hydrogen ions into its lumen, keeping the environment acidic. That acidity helps the ligand detach from its receptor. So it's like a sorting center. The receptors are going to get recycled back to the plasma membrane. What's left behind are the ligands in the endosome, which is now going to form the late endosome. That late endosome will fuse with the lysosome. The lysosomal hydrolases break down and digest the content. A classic example used for receptor-mediated endocytosis is with low-density lipoprotein receptors, which take up LDL cholesterol from blood. 
It goes through this process in the cell and gets broken down to cholesterol. So that's just an example of receptor-mediated endocytosis. Clathrin is the most studied in endocytosis, but there are clathrin-independent methods as well. For example, caviole in endothelial cells. So there's lots of different kinds of endocytosis, but all of it would involve things entering into the cell. What about leaving the cell? What would the cell want to throw out other than waste material? Proteins, hormones, neurotransmitters, things like that. Stuff that it synthesizes and has to leave the cell and go somewhere else and perform its function. Proteins get synthesized in the cell and then they go through all modifications through the endoplasmic reticulum and then through the Golgi apparatus to get packaged into vesicles. If the content of these vesicles has to leave the cell, it will do so by exocytosis. There are different pathways for that, like there's the constitutive pathway, where when it's synthesized, the content gets released. There's no storage. These are called secretory vesicles. The second type is regulated, where the content can be stored, such that when there is a signal, it can get released into the extracellular space. An example of this is at the synapse, like the neuromuscular junction. The neurotransmitter is stored in vesicles, and when the action potential arrives, calcium enters the cell and makes the vesicles fuse with the membrane. The fusion of the vesicle to the membrane involves different proteins. One complex is the V-snare-T-snare complex. V is for a vesicular and T is for the target organelle. Along with this, there are other proteins and GTPases. Now this complex, it helps with docking of the vesicle onto the membrane so that the two can fuse and the contents of the vesicle can be released. There are actually different ways that this could happen. One would be where the vesicle briefly opens, releases what's inside, and then closes. So it can be recycled and used again, which is one of the ways that exocytosis happens at a synapse. Another way would be complete fusion with the target membrane, and then releasing the contents of the vesicle. If it does fully fuse, in exocytosis, the cell gains membrane, and in endocytosis, a bit of the membrane gets back into the cell. The two thus couple, so the cell size stays the same. And that is endocytosis and exocytosis. If this video helps you, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.